So what was the Gilded Age and, and why did it happen? Ah, the Gilded Age is this fascinating period from about 1870 to 1900. You can change the dates a little bit, but that's, so we're talking post-Civil War. America becomes an in industrial powerhouse. The cities rise. So in 1850, fewer people live in the cities than in the rural part of the country. By 1900, more, pe 1900, more people live uh, in the cities. And basically, you have the birth of the railroads. The railroads get connected in uh, 1869, going all the way, Continental Railroad going all the way across the country. You have the rise of oil as um, and John Rockefeller. And basically, this period, think of Rockefeller and Vanderbilt um, as uh, and Carnegie um, and J.P. Morgan as powerful the way we think of presidents. Presidents during this period kind of were on the descent, but the, but the magnets of industry, railroad, oil, steel, those were all banking. Those were the, the superheroes in America. And they led to this amazing growth in industrialization, uh, but then also huge disparities. Um, no labor laws uh, that we would be familiar with today. So you had this industrialization with people working in the industries who had no protections, child labor, working 22 hours a day, horrible health conditions. Um, so this gurgling, booming America, um, but where there's great disparities between who's doing well and, uh, and who's not. And it was called gilded because those who were doing well were living very well. Right, gilded as in a gilded frame, covered with gold. This came from a novel by, by Mark Twain. Um, and uh, that's right, it takes on the, the cast of this extraordinary wealth. Um, uh, uh, Rockefeller was the first billionaire in America. Um, Vanderbilt built the biggest house, still the biggest house in America during this period. So the wealth was, um, people would make eight to ten dollars in a week. Some of these tycoons were making eight to ten dollars in a minute. Uh, and so that kind of vast wealth, because you could, you could only make so much wealth before, this is just mountains of wealth and then also again this great disparity. And it seems like it came from really technology. Technology allowed all of this productivity, the railroads, steel, et cetera, et cetera, and then of course finance was able to, to, to get in there and help move capital more efficiently. What parallels do you see with our current age where technology seems to be doing something similar, where we have all of these new industries and, and new wealth, but, it, but some fear that it might be causing some inequality? You have, you, yes, you have a couple of things. You have um, innovation in these various different industries, both innovation in the creation of things, but then also innovations in the structures of business, mm -hmm. buying up small businesses, creating big conglomerates, then using that leverage and power uh, to then uh, crowd out competitors for sure, but then also to raise prices because you're the only game in town. Um, and you also have business practices that are not um, the sort of the laissez-faire economic a belief said essentially that in the economy it was like in uh, in the American system, which was let it operate. Don't get in the way, don't mess with it, because when it operates, it runs the most efficiently for America. In the end, markets can be messy, but they're going to have the best outcome. That's right. Is what is the argument behind lazy fair? That's exactly right, and it got this wonderful assist. Uh, from Charles Darwin, who said, we can explain the growth of, or we can explain the species, and we can explain our natural world with this theory about the competition uh, among the species, and, and this term survival of the fittest, mm -hmm. social Darwinism. So survival of the fittest, which some, and I certainly thought, might have come from Darwin, didn't. It came from Herbert Spencer, who basically had an economic theory of survival of the fittest, and it went this way. Some people have more talent than others. And when they exercise their talent, they do very well, and that's the best thing for society. It believed that society was ever increasing. It didn't mean that every single person was increasing, but that if you followed survival of the fittest and the best people did the best, then ultimately society would always be on an evolutionary plane of moving upward. And so that was the theory behind get out of the way of these big uh, companies and these big tycoons, and they will do the best uh, for America. And so the reason that was I important was A, it kept government out of the way, B, it kept religious, um, uh, it, it, it created a religion that, um, it was a secular religion, of <laughs> course, but it created a theory that said, wow, that looks like what you're doing is totally self-interested, but there's this theory behind it and everybody will improve, so okay, go ahead. Yeah, that was the, the beginning of Gordon Gecko's famous greed is good. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's... Yeah, greed is good. So the comparison to our current moment is you have huge disparity 
and, um, and technologies that are, to use a cliche of the day, disruptive, that are completely changing the way everybody does business, changing the, 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 the when we think about the, the way in which Americans uh, behave, that rapid sense of change, um, it's changing culture rapidly and it's making big winners and losers and those big disparities are, exist as well. How did the Gilded Age play out? Were some of these forces moderated eventually, maybe around 1900? And, and do you think similar things might happen for us? There were two big moderations in the in response to the Gilded Age. You had uh, government came back, came awake again, and you had, uh, uh, and then you also had labor movements um, that that came into uh, into formation, basically to slow down the, the the growth and the rapacious demands of the Gilded Age. Politics during the Gilded Age kind of went um, became an offshoot of. Uh, the titans of industry. If you look at the presidency between 1876 and 1892, there's, they're all one-term presidents, mm. and none of them get more than 50% of the vote. And basically what the presidents spent their time doing is using the spoil system, which is essentially putting people in jobs to pay off the local bosses who helped them get elected. Mm. So getting elected was, became a job of staying elected, and that meant doling out patronage, um, get basically giving people jobs who were your friends so that they would go and vote for you because these elections are all very close. And that's not getting a lot of work done uh, for the people. Some of them, Rutherford B. Hayes tried these little efforts at civil service reform, which was essentially meant putting people in jobs who could monitor the factories, make sure that um, people weren't uh, getting uh, abused or, or that health wasn't declining or that anything that a government might do that we think of today um, but his political patrons didn't want that. Um, so that was all uh, very hard to do. What happened in the, on the workers' end is they realized, um, and, the, and the most famous moment was in 1911, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, where uh, a number of women working in a garment factory, are there's a fire, uh, and the, the um, bosses lock the doors, and I think 40-some-odd women die, mostly women, um, um, and it highlighted the, the labor issues, but labor, labor unions start to organize, and there are huge clashes and strikes and consumer boycotts, and those start to put some pressure on business um, to change their practices, at least in terms of uh, worker hours and, and the kinds of things that we now would certainly take for granted. Wow, wow, fascinating. It's an incredible period. Yeah.